Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other world. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv You're listening to Revolution Radio. Then I inquired of one of the angels who went with me and who showed me every secret thing concerning this son of man, who he was, whence he was, and why he accompanied the ancient of days. He answered and said to me, This is the son of man to whom righteousness belongs with whom righteousness has dwelt, and who will reveal all the treasures of that which is concealed. For the Lord of Spirits has chosen him, and his portion has surpassed all before the Lord of Spirits in everything uprightness. This Son of Man whom you behold shall raise up kings and the mighty from their dwelling places, and the powerful from their thrones, shall loosen the bridles of the powerful, and break in pieces the teeth of sinners. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio. And I thank all of you for taking the time to join us this evening. I have as co host Kathy Dunson. Kathy, are you there, sister? I am. Hello, everyone. Well, thank you for joining us. And as special guests, we have Dave Murphy joining us for the next two hours. And at the top of the hour at nine o'clock, we'll have Anthony Woodcock, uh, God Rules on YouTube, joining us. And Dave is also known as Allegedly Dave on YouTube. Dave, are you there, brother? Yes, I am. Hi there. Uh, well, I'm glad that um, everything sounds good as far as uh, your mic and everything on that side. And thank you for joining us. And uh, welcome, everybody, in the chat room. And uh, before we get started, Dave, let me give you a chance to give out your website contact information and where people can go to find and support your work. Um, okay, well, my YouTube channel is dmurphy25, and uh, I have a website which uh, isn't at the best of, uh, in the best of states at the moment, but uh, it's um, www.allegedlydave.com. All right. Well, uh, Dave's a very interesting individual. We had a chance to interview him just a couple weeks back, and we spoke of all kind of very interesting subjects but in this evening we're going to talk about um, and have discussion on whether the prophecies and whether Christ as individual who fulfilled those prophecies is real or myth um, and Dave's going to present his viewpoint and establish it uh, in the first hour um, he is of the opinion that the Christ is a mythology that was made up by the Catholic Church, um, and if I'm wrong, Dave, most certainly feel free to interject. But oh, well uh, done. Okay, and um, I do believe that uh, that Kathy would like to share something before we go into this topic, and so uh, Kathy, I'll turn it over to you. Well, this is something that is a uh, little known. Um, I know I had never heard about it. But it's about the mathematical evidence and divine inspiration of the scriptures. Um, and this is information uh, in, that comes through Dr. Ivan Pannon. It's a, a short um, summary of a lot of his work. And I'll read that. It won't take too long. Uh, one of the most remarkable occurrences in our time is God's preparation of one individual to produce positive evidence that would completely undermine all biblical criticism and bring atheism toppling to the ground wherever honest, I'm sorry, wherever honest thinking men will face the facts. More startling still is the fact that this individual was a converted Russian nihilist, a Harvard scholar, and a mathematician. 
at the very time when organized atheism was laying its plan to get control of Russia and make use of its vast resources to sow the seeds of atheism in every nation of the earth, God was preparing his Russian, Ivan Panin, to bring forth scientific evidence of the verbal and plenary inspiration of the Holy Scriptures in the original languages. Dr. Panin, who passed away in October 1942, after 50 years of work on Bible numerics, was not the first to discover that there was a strange mathematical structure running through the Bible. There was Brown in his Ordo Seclorium and Grant in his Numbers of the Bible and Bollinger in his Numbers of the Scriptures. These all brought forth some striking examples of numeric features in the Bible. It remained for Dr. Pennon, however, by giving his very life to the task to find that every letter of the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts is numbered and occupies its own special place in the order of the total number of letters in the Bible. The slightest variations of the or, or, mm, or <laughs> orthograph or author, I don't know how to say that orthography being all God ordained. Since every Greek and Hebrew letter carries a numerical value, letters being used for figures in these languages, every word, phrase, sentence, and paragraph has a definite arithmetical sum. Dr. Pannon devoted himself so persistently to counting letters and working out mathematical problems that he often wore himself out physically. His works were voluminous and his discoveries seemingly without end. He was the author of a volume, Structure of the Bible, and a revision of the New Testament based upon his numeric discoveries. Pannon's establishing of the practically infinite series of complex systems in the Hebrew and Greek texts, all sequences, combinations, ratio, etc., following a uniform design from Genesis to Revelation, is undoubtedly God's answer to modern atheism and higher criticism and his vindication of the verbal and plenary inspiration of scripture. The discovery settles many questions of text. It proves that the books of our present Bible and they alone have the required features. It settles disputes of long standing as to some portions which scholars have said should be eliminated from the Bible. The doctrine of the divine authority of the scriptures has always been fully sustained by the proofs from fulfilled prophecy from the inexhaustible depths of truth revealed, from its matchless power over the lives of men, from its indestructibility, and from the testimony of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. However, some have been won to wave these lines of evidence aside as unscientific. Dr. Pannon has submitted conclusive scientific proof that the Bible could not have been produced by the unaided human mind. This proof is found in the amazing numeric phenomena in the very structure of the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. Dr. Pannon demonstrated either that every writer of scripture was an unparalleled literary and mathematical genius, or that he wrote as he was moved by the Holy Ghost. And if anyone would like information on that, I have a document I've put together because some things have been hard to find since, but write to me. My email address is perilandra77 at gmail.com, P-E-R-E-L-A-N-D-R-A-7-7 at gmail.com. I've got a lot more on this, and, and it's his numbers and, and all that. There's, there's more I was going to read, but I thought I'd just let it stop there. You guys go on ahead. Okay, well, um, hmm. it's a, just I'll make a real quick comment, and then I'll get you to comment, Dave. It, it was interesting to me... Um, in studying Dr. Ivan Panin's work to see that this mathematical code is uh, revealed in both the Old and the New Testament. And it shows a seamless, you know, as far as that, it, it seems to confirm that most certainly they are both divinely inspired and that they were meant to be composed and um, brought together in the way, in the manner that we have it now. But uh, Dave, are you familiar with Dr. Ivan Panin at all? No, I'm not, um, to be honest. Um, the, uh, I've, I've heard lots of um, different kind of arguments saying about numerology and, uh, and, and, and things like that. Um, when Kathy was reading that, the first thing that was uh, going through my head was 
talking to uh, globe earthers and listening to them spout what um, what Newton was saying and uh, how the mathematical um, perfection of Newton's work and all that and um, and how that absolutely proves that uh, gravity you know is is a force even though it's even though it's not considered a force anymore. Um, Although I would say here that the difference is there's no way that this could possibly have been done. What he has proven and shown in the structure that it would have to have been, uh, he, he said that the laws of probability are exceeded into the billions when we try and rationalize the authorship of the Bible as the work of a man. He said, if human logic is worth anything at all, we are simply driven to the conclusion that if his facts as presented are true, man could not have done this. That's quite different from Newton. Right. Well, I, I can't comment on, on this work because I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. So, and, you know, um, without, you know, doing all the years and years of work that uh, he's done, I... Uh, I can't, I can't sort of pull through it and uh, and say, well, that's wrong, that's wrong. But it strikes me that, um, yes, he's talking about sixty six books. But I, I look at, uh, you know, the apocrypha as well. I mean, does that fit in, or does it, you know, the fact that um, in the apocrypha there's the rest of Esther. So was he looking at the full? Um, text of Esther, or was he just, um, you know, just looking at the allowed part of Esther? You know, do, 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 does that figure in his calculations? I, I don't know. It, it, there are lots of books that uh, were left out, it, probably even before this guy even got to see them. Um, so I, I don't know. I can't really comment on it because I don't know this work. Well, the yeah. last thing I'll, I'll add to that, and this is one thing that really intrigued me, that he had put in the New York Times, I, I believe it was in the Times, he challenged uh, nine noted rationalists and Bible critics. Oh, wait, it was the New York Sun, because this was in 1899. He dared them to publicly refute his findings, and none of them would dare take the challenge. So uh, it's, it's really, it, I remember first reading this and I was stunned at the findings of, that he had made of the mathematical inerrancy of, of things within the Bible. I mean, I can't describe it. That's why I'm saying if anybody wants to see this work, I'd be more than happy to send this to them. It's like a 13-page summary. I mean, he spent 50 years and, and wrote on this. So that but, was uh, uh, as I as I'm trying to say, it's like um, somebody placing a, a, a whole blackboard full of uh, of calculus, and uh, you know, in front of me and saying thus gravity, um, and I'm like, well, <laughs> I don't understand what's up there. Um, should I just accept that you're right, or should I just um, you know try and? <laughs> Well, that's why I added. That's why I wanted to add that about his challenge that he had put out, and no one uh, responded to his challenge. I mean, there um, were specific people, and it was it was publicized, and it. it I mean, it's. I'm sure nobody they, wanted This to isn't spend, a haphazard thing. I'm sure and nobody wanted to spend fifty years um, looking through his work. Uh, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Well, I, I doubt it. it's that kind of a thing. I mean, it's it's much more precise. People, especially in that day and age, he was a Harvard scholar and mathematician. He was well, very well respected. As a matter of fact, when he um, he because he was an atheist and a nihilist, as I'd said, uh, from Russia, when he became a Christian, it ma it was such a big deal that it made headlines in the papers where he uh -huh. he lived. I mean, we're talking 1899, but that's quite unique. So I did want to point that out because I thought um, as, as an opening for this show, some supernatural um, attestation to the Old Testament and New Testament would be a, a nice thing to begin with. So. Right. Well, it's, it's one that I can't verify and I, therefore I can't, you know, I can't really say, okay, that's a given because I, I can't look at it and go, hmm, yeah, he's yeah. right. You know? We understand. It's all good. We just uh, thought would bring it up or she thought she'd bring it up just to you know bring it to your attention and you can mm -hmm. check it out later at some other point in time and then uh you know well, i'm sure i don't have 50 years to go for any time. well it, it doesn't take 50 years to i mean he wrote a book yeah. i have a 13 page document yeah it doesn't even take that much i mean i it you can 
studied 15 minutes um, to see how the mathematical code has been laid out and, and divinely inspired, according to him. You can uh, understand the mathematics in 15 minutes, are you saying? Yeah, is that yeah, what you're saying? Yeah, because all, it, it's a, a simple matter of, um, it's a repeating pattern of sevens, which are show the supernaturalness of um, the code that he found um, embedded within the text. And so, yeah, it's not like it's, you know, Harvard level mathematics and that you have to be a professor to decipher it. The code is simple to understand and that when you examine and look at it, uh, you can get a very good understanding of what he's proposing in, you know, a single hour. So, um, yeah, just <laughs> call me uh, pedantic, but uh, if it uh, if it's that simple to figure out, then how, how come it took him 50 years? Well, he's verifying it in many different ways. And so he dedicated his life to uh, examining it through all the books of the Bibles. And so okay. that's what took an extensive amount of time. Uh, but okay. it, but anyways, well, uh, we, we don't need to talk about that now because you haven't seen it. You don't know about no. it, and so there's no sense um, elaborating on it. Um, mm -hmm. But I would like to go ahead because the time is going to quickly run out before... Anthony joins us, and so I want to give you a chance to um, bring forth your proposal as to why it is that you do not believe or that you believe all the prophecies as laid out in the Old Testament and other books, like those that I sent you earlier today, are you know were made up by the Catholic Church, or um, you said that you believe that Marcion is the author of the entire New Testament, and so let's... Um, Let's give you a chance to establish that. Okay, well, um, first of all, um, I, um, I've mentioned this before, I, I was an atheist for, for 40 years, um, had no, no exposure to the Bible whatsoever, no sort of um, uh, preconceptions from priests and uh, vicars and whatever. Um, literally, I thought it was a book of fiction, didn't want anything to do with it. Um, the events of the last 10 years have been prompting me and prodding me towards um, you know, taking a look at the book. And um, uh, along the way, I found out a lot of information, um, not only about the book itself, but about myself, my place in the book. And, um, and essentially, I, I started looking at this book um, as, you know, with, with fresh eyes, um, with no expectations or anything. So if I found that um, Jesus permeated the whole of the, uh, you know, the two Testaments, then I, I would be a Jesus believer right now. Um, but um, I'm, I, just, I just went at this looking for the truth. So um, I've used this analogy before. Um, what I found is that it, it appears to be like um, watching a, um, a, a TV series that's gone on for six seasons, and you know you're looking at it, you're watching it, you're you know developing um, your own ideas about it and understandings about it, and then in the last season you get a brand new writer who uh, doesn't understand the previous six seasons but then introduces a brand new character and twists the last season to make it seem like that that character is, is what the whole thing's been about. That's how it felt. It's, you, you read the, uh, the Old Testament, it's one story. It's a story that makes sense. It's about one, one bloodline following it from beginning to end. And even in, in Genesis, it starts from beginning to end. Um, to the end days, and uh, literally, there's no space for the for the New Testament. Um, none, none at all. It doesn't make sense. You know, you, it, it's a book from beginning to end, and then there's this other book tacked on the end that uh, isn't mentioned in in the Old Testament. I know you're going to disagree with that, but you know, as far as I can tell, it's not mentioned in the Old Testament, and um, um, all the claims. That uh, they say that oh, there's prophecy of um, you know the work, the acts and works of Jesus in the Old Testament. Well, every time somebody says, "Look, it's prophesized here," I go, "Okay, let me have a look," and I go and look, and 
not using any trickery, not using any um, <laughs> preconceptions or um, or anything, just using the the basic rules of uh, of grammar to understand what's being um, written about. Um, I I look at the the verse that's mentioned. I go back in the in the chapter. Um, uh, let's say it said this verse says he. You know, he did this, he did that. Well, who's he? You've got to go back in the text to find out the very first time that word is used. He is used. And then find out who that he is being, you know, who he is. Because it's usually so-and-so did this, and he did that, and he, so on and so on. So when you do that, you find, well, actually, that he isn't talking about anybody in the future. It's usually talking about somebody right there and then, in a situation that's happening in that contemporary time. And so far, every time somebody's pointed me to one, I've, I've literally, in real time, said, OK, give me a few minutes, have a look, and then come back and, uh, you know, with a, with a write-up that says, OK, well, I've looked at it, and um, it actually refers to the children of Jacob. And the response, I, you know, the typical response I get from the people who've, uh, who've challenged me is usually the thread gets deleted or I'm blocked <laughs> and, uh, and the whole thing disappears. Um, so much so that I've started to copy whatever I write so that it just doesn't, all that work that I put into it just doesn't get lost. Um, so that response I've seen before. You know, every time I'm, you know, I, I go up head to head with a globe earther and, uh, you know, I challenge something and then they could, there's nothing they can say. It's literally, you know, I, I'm off. Thread's gone, um, you know, you're blocked. No, you know, end of story. Um, it's, it's cognitive dissonance. Um, it's, it's pure and simple, cognitive dissonance. Um, that's, that's, that's my basic, you know, basic argument. I'm not, gonna, you know, I'm not really going to go into... Um, a lot more detail, unless you really want to go into a lot more detail, because um, I could use an example of this, um, of one of the prophecies, if you wish. Don't know how you want to go with uh, that. Before we do that, I want to uh, get you, ask you if you had read all the information that I sent you earlier today, because all of the prophecies that I sent is part of this document, and there were numerous, um, many dozens of them, and they were all based upon Old Testament prophets because you, um, in our first discussion, you told me that you believe that, you know, everything as far as the New Testament and the apostles, that all of that was fabricated and also mm -hmm. that there's no connections as far as the prophecies uh, of Christ and how he came and fulfilled those prophecies found in the Old Testament. And yet, as I read at the very beginning of the show, there's a prophecy in the book of Enoch, which speaks mm -hmm. about uh, the Son of Man, and it connects yeah. directly to Yeshua. And yeah. then there were, then there were all the others that I had sent you. And um, did you get a chance to look those over? Because again, and I'm, I, and as I said uh, in an earlier email, I will do a follow-up show on these because I don't want to spend all that time reading all this material here, but. Uh, are you saying that you can refute all of those prophecies as well? Well, um, first of all, uh, your document was sent two hours ago, and literally I, I got it about 45 minutes ago, so um, I'm sorry, I can't go through that huge document you sent me, so I can, I can you know, argue about it. The, the point is, there's something like, um, and nobody seems to actually know the actual number, but it's something like 300 or 320 or 400 um, different um, so-called prophecies. Um, yeah, that's just from the um, from the the canonical text. Yes. The, right. Yeah. So there, there's a great number of them, and um, th most of them. And first of all, none of them say Jesus. And okay, that's obvious. None of them say Jesus. Okay, um, let's let's put that aside. None of them say Jesus, even though um, throughout the Old Testament, it's very usually it's very clear who they're talking about. Yeah, 
it's um you know if it if it means david it will say david yeah um so jesus is not mentioned even when they say oh yes jesus is mentioned it's like um emmanuel well no jesus was never named or uh, called emmanuel you know um this is what i'm trying to say is you know the the old testament especially um in hebrew hebrew is a concrete language or absolute concrete language okay um if it if it wants to mean something it means something okay it's that you know as as it's concrete it's not conceptual it doesn't it doesn't uh, make kind of um, analogies as such the only way it sounds like that is the the transfer from a concrete language into a symbolic and abstract language like english or greek or, or whatever um but when hebrew wants to say something it says it in a concrete way so um it doesn't make sense that it would uh, just hint at somebody and not tell you who it was uh it it directly all these other passages they describe uh jesus who i call him yeshua um as the word of god and as the son of god and mm -hmm. so he is the only son of god and so the first born son of god not understand and the there are and there are passages uh, which directly relate to and also name him in description uh, like for instance name I'll him in sure. description that's <laughs> no uh, let, let just listen to this this is from the ascension of isaiah this is just one of the many examples that I sent you, uh, it says, And he who permitted thee, this is thy Lord God, the Lord Christ, who will be called Jesus in the world, but his name thou cannot hear till thou hast ascended out of thy body. And I'm not going to read the rest of this text, but it goes into great detail of how he would be born of a virgin, that he would be from the tribe of Judah, um, all those same things which are affirmed by Isaiah and other prophets, even Enoch, in the Old Testament, and even Daniel. The ascension uh, of the ascension of Isaiah isn't in, in, in the Old Testament, is it? No, but it is a pseudepigraphal right, well, book. Well, not not according to the pseudepigrapha I've got. I don't see it in there. <laughs> and well, then maybe you don't have the full pseudepigrapha. We'll no, be right back. Not. Hold on, because this is part of that, and you don't have it. Apparently not. <laughs> All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, bring up really quick that uh, there's a prophecy in Daniel chapter nine, verses twenty-four through twenty-seven, which specifically five hundred years prior spoke about and predicted the coming of Jesus, and even spoke of the exact year that he would be cut off. And so, I mean, and then again, like with Isaiah and others, there's many prophecies contained within the Old Testament that do um, prophetically uh, call for and s speak about the coming of Christ and even the second coming because there's so much now that will be fulfilled in our lifetime because I do believe we are the fig tree generation and that um, at the end of the at the end of this this generation there will be the second coming but uh, go ahead Dave well first of all can we agree on, on one thing here that um, thus saith the Most High trumps thus saith man. Well, yeah, of course. Right, okay, good, good. Um, what does firstborn son mean? Firstborn son. No, just, you know, what does that mean? Yeah, it means firstborn son. Okay, so that means then somebody else can't come along afterwards and be called firstborn son. Um, as far as what, yeah, of course, yeah. Of course. So why does it say in the Old Testament that uh, out of all the tribe, all the people or nations on, on, on earth, Israel is the Most High's firstborn son, okay? Then it says, that's, that's in Exodus 4.22. Um, then it says in Jeremiah 31.9, but um, out of all the tribes, Ephraim is his firstborn, right? Then later on in Psalms, Psalms 89, 
20 to 27, I think it is. Um, it says that out of all the people on earth, David is his for, firstborn son. And later on, David confirms that in Psalm 2, 7. He says, I, I will declare the decree the Most High hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. So how can somebody come along afterwards and claim to be a firstborn son or only begotten son when David, hundreds of years before, basically has been confirmed as the Most High's firstborn son? From the mouth of the Most High, thus saith the Most High. Well, this is different from who Yeshua was because Yeshua pre-existed with with God. He wasn't a, a son of um, a son of as far as a, you know being born into the flesh until his coming, and he came through David's line, uh, which it was prophesied that he would do so. Uh, he came through David's line, did he? Yeah, he did. Okay. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the uh, reckoning of ancestry is patrilineal. It goes through the father. Okay? So if, you know, the, uh, the Holy Ghost or, or the Creator himself um, impregnated Mary, so how can, he, how can Jesus have come through the line of David or the line of Judah? Because it's patrilineal. Because it's still Mary is connected through uh, David's line. Mm -hmm. Naturally, nearly. Uh, which even, even still. Which doesn't, doesn't um, confer, you know, um, genetic seed. That's not, that's not the seed. So how, how, how can he be of, um, of the line of Judah if, um, if there's no father? Well, if you look at uh, Luke chapter 3, where it gives the lineage... Uh, it shows that he was, in fact, the fulfillment of that line. And God, being born of God, he fulfilled um, being the only begotten and in coming into flesh form, which well, is why all of these prophecies spoke about him coming and being born of a virgin. And so it was fulfilled in uh, that way. Interesting. Okay, so interesting you brought that up, actually, because the, um, the born of a virgin idea um, comes from Isaiah 714 okay now that was one that keeps being brought up that uh, this is the absolute proof 714 um, you know he will be born of a virgin and when you look at the uh, when you look at the verse yes it does does kind of sound very sort of Jesus like but again when you start looking back and actually reading the context, yeah, as anybody would do, I think I mentioned this last time, if you open up a book in the middle and it just starts off with, he said this, you've got to figure out who he is. So you do that to um, Isaiah 7. And basically it says that in the days of King Ahaz, um, the, uh, the kingdoms of uh, Syria and Ephraim joined forces and attacked Jerusalem but couldn't beat them. And Ahaz was so afraid of uh, them at being attacked again, the Most High basically comes along and says, "Don't worry, um, they're not they're not gonna they're not gonna attack you anymore. You know, ask ask me for a sign, and I'll give you a sign so you'll be reassured." Ahaz basically says, "I'm not going to tempt you." So the, the Most High basically says, "I'm going to give you a sign." Yeah, a a a. a Boy is going to be born of a virgin, and um, he will eat butter and honey. And before he is able to discern between good and evil, um, both lands that um, are afflicting you will be um, will be will have their kings removed. Their kings will die. So further on in the chapter, um, a child is born, and um, he, it also says about how. Um, the Most High actually causes bees to come into the land and um, there will uh, be an overproduction of milk. So everybody in the land was eating butter and honey. Okay, Again, Jesus never ate butter and honey. 
the child is born and, you know, I think the, the line is, um, therefore the Lord himself will give you, shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, again, Jesus was never, ever called Emmanuel. He never ate butter and honey. That wasn't ever in the, you know, in the New Testament anywhere. Um, the point is, later on in this chapter, um, when everyone's eating butter and honey, the, uh, the two kings basically uh, get killed. And, uh, and the prophecy is fulfilled. And then the end of the, the chapter ends with, and thus passes Ahaz. That's it. The whole story is, is ended right there. It doesn't go, it doesn't sort of, um, you know, foreshadow anything in the future. It's talking about an event that happened back in those days, right, and, and has nothing to do with Jesus. And anybody can read this and, and get the context. I'm not doing any magic here, here. I'm just reading a book. Yes, but the story wasn't fulfilled until the virgin conceived, which did not happen until Mary's time. And I'll, I'll share... No, no, no. It says it in here. It, it talks about he shall eat butter and honey. Then it talks about the, the events that made sure that everybody eats butter and honey. <laughs> Okay, and before but the, before the child, before the child, hang on, before the child is um, old enough to refuse good and evil, the two kings would be dead. The two kings died in that time. All right, well, that is not the fulfillment of the prophecy. And I'll share That's... with you a story of when the virgin actually conceived. Uh, this is found on, I'm, I'm sorry, this I is the you, story. I let you speak, so let me speak okay. as well. Um, and the, you can read about the virgin, the virgin actually conceiving in the Protoevangelion of James. I'm going to read really quick um, passages connected what? to that. Just listen. All mm -hmm. right, it says this. And I saw a woman coming down from the hill country, and she said to me, O oh man, whither art thou going? And I said, I am seeking an Hebrew midwife. And she answered and said unto me, Art thou of Israel? And I said to her, Yes. And she said, And who is it that is bringing forth in the cave? And I said, A woman betrothed to me. And she said to me, Is she not that wife? And I said to her, It is Mary that was reared in the temple of the Lord, and I obtained her by lot as my wife. And yet she is not my wife, but has conceived of the Holy Spirit. And the midwife said to him, Is this true? And Joseph said to her, Come and see. And the midwife went away with him, and they stood in the place of the cave, and behold, a luminous cloud overshadowed the cave, and the midwife said, My soul has been magnified this day, because mine eyes have seen strange things, because salvation has been brought forth to Israel. And immediately the cloud disappeared out of the cave, and a great light shone in the cave so that the eyes could not bear it. And in a little, the light that gradually decreased until the infant appeared, and went and took the breast from his mother, Mary. And the midwife cried out and said, this is a great day to me because I have seen this strange sight. And the midwife went forth out of the cave, and Salome met her, and she said to her, Salome, Salome, I have a strange sight to see, to relate to thee. A virgin has brought forth a thing which her nature admits not of. Then said Salome, as the Lord my God liveth, unless I thrust in my finger and search the parts, I will not believe that a virgin has brought forth. And the midwife went in and said to Mary, Show thyself, for no small controversy has arisen about thee. And Salome put in her finger and cried out and said, Woe is me for mine iniquity and mine unbelief, because I have tempted the living God. And behold, my hand is dropping off as it if burned with fire. And she bent on her knees before the Lord, saying, O God of my fathers, remember that I am the seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Do not make a show of me to the sons of Israel, but restore me to the poor, for thou knowest, O Lord, that in thy name I have performed my services, and that I have received my reward at thy hand. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by her, saying to her, Salome, Salome, the Lord hath heard thee. Put thy hand to the infant, and carry it, and thou wilt have safety and joy. And Salome went and carried it, saying, I will worship him, because a great king has been born to Israel. And behold, Salome was immediately cured 
and she went forth out of the cave justified. And behold, a voice saying, Salome, Salome, tell not the strange things thou hast seen until the child has come into Jerusalem. And so this is what is referenced as the fulfillment because this is the only time that a virgin brought forth. And this was in reference to uh, Jesus, Yeshua, as the, uh, the Son of God because it was by the Holy Spirit that she conceived. And afterwards, Salome verified that she was still yet a virgin. It's, uh, it's funny, I didn't hear anything about, um, you know, Retzin, the king of uh, Syria, or um, Pekka, the king of uh, Israel, uh, who was supposed to die after this uh, child was born. Well, there's um, still, this is the only time that a virgin had brought forth. I, how, I, how can I you have under- a fulfillment of a prophecy when there's no virgin conceiving? I understand. But can, can I but, ask a question? Right. Yeah, go I, ahead, Kathy. Well, I think this this one is a little involved. I mean, I I don't know anything about it, and and you guys know more. But I think it's a little involved, and we may just be stuck on this one. It, could you guys talk about another? Yeah, let's go for it. Um, because I'm sure, Dave, you should have many other points if you've, um, you know, have a set of I mean, not to mind. discount okay. it, Dave. It's just that you guys will be stuck on it, and then the time's gone. And, sure. and I, I can see just looking online, because I'm unfamiliar with it, that it's involved. <laughs> okay. The, the, the point I was trying to make is, is if you read that story, in, it, it's a story in itself, okay? It, it begins at the beginning, ends at the end there. It doesn't refer to anything in the future. It's, it's a complete story. Looking um, at the Strong's definitions and that, I can see there's more from it in there as well. I mean, Hebrew is, is not, and anyway, that, I just yeah. was asking. Okay. All right, well, um, so more points about, uh, about Jesus then. Um, well, can yeah. you address really quick the, the prophecy in Daniel 9.24 and 9.27, which spoke about uh, mm-hmm. Yeshua's coming and how 9, it ties 24, together? 9.24 and 9.27. Okay, let's have a look then. 9.24, did you say? Yeah. Um, 70 weeks. Uh, a vision to anoint the most holy. Okay. 9.24 doesn't say anything about... Uh, as far as I can tell, it doesn't say anything about Jesus. <laughs> um, and he it says prefer. Messiah. Christ. Saint, uh, anoint the most holy. That's all. The word anoint doesn't, uh, you know, it, anointed one means, uh, Messiah means anointed one. It just says anoint the most holy. It doesn't say anything about uh, an anointed one. Um, 927. She confirmed uh, uh Okay, again, I see nothing that says Jesus. I say, it's in, oh, did you say 926? I see Messiah in 926. 924 through 927. Uh, okay, sorry. And after three, three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Messiah just means anointed one. There was many anointed ones. Uh, but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come to destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, again, Messiah just means anointed one. Um, and uh, David, King David, was an anointed one. Um, in Psalms eighty nine twenty, it says, I found David my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him. Thus saith the Most High. Okay, I'm going to read an interpretation of this particular <sighs> chapter, and you can study. It's going to be real quick, but you can look at it later, but those that have broken down and deciphered this passage, it alludes to directly to the time of Christ's arrival and also to his death. And so I'll read what it says here really quick. From where? This is uh, from an article from somebody that broke it down, and you can look it up yourself. Just look up um, Daniel's prophecy on the coming of Christ and the death of Christ, and then you can study it for yourself. But it says, uh, the prophet Daniel lived more than 500 years before the birth of Jesus. Nevertheless, Jehovah revealed to Daniel information that would make it possible to pinpoint the time when Jesus would be anointed or appointed as the Messiah or Christ. 
Daniel was told you should know and understand that from the issuing of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the leader, there will be seven weeks, also 62 weeks. So this is giving you a specific time. And we know that the rebuilding of Jerusalem, that was after Nebuchadnezzar's um, dispensation, uh, uh, diaspora of the Hebrew people for the 70 years. And then Cyrus and Darius appointed, um, allowed them to return to the Holy Land and funded the rebuilding of the temple. So that's what it's speaking about. And so if you break down the math on that, it says, um, to determine the time of the Messiah's arrival, first we need to learn the starting point of the period leading to the Messiah. According to the prophecy, it is from the issuing of the word to restore and to build Jerusalem. When did this issuing of the word take place? According to the Bible writer Nehemiah, the word to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem was issued in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. That's Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1 and 5 through 8. Historians confirm that the year 474 BCE was Artaxerxes' first full year as ruler. Therefore, the 20th year of his rule was 455 BCE. Now we have the starting point for Daniel's messianic prophecy. That is 455 BCE. Daniel indicates how long the time period leading to the arrival of the Messiah, the leader, would last. The prophecy mentions seven weeks, also 62 weeks, a total of 69 weeks. How long is this period of time? Several Bible translations note that these are not weeks of seven days, but weeks of years. That is, each week represents seven years. This concept of weeks of years or seven-year units was familiar to Jews of ancient times. For instance, they observed the Sabbath year every seventh year. Therefore, the prophetic 69 weeks amount to 69 units of seven years each, or a total of 483 years. Now, all we must do is count. If we count from 455 BCE, a period of 483 years takes us to the year 29 CE. That was the exactly the year when Jesus was baptized and became the Messiah. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. 221 and 22. Is that not a remarkable fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Now, because you're not familiar with this, I know you can't elaborate in great detail on this, but you, you know, it, we'll give it's you. It's kind of like me coming, it's like me coming down here with a, a document from a bloke down the pub, yeah, and, and reading it and, uh, oh, okay, you've got to accept this, okay, because bloke down the pub told me, yeah. I'm well, this sorry. Is different. This is encoded in scripture. Okay. This was written 500 years and it's in scripture and it has been confirmed to be written 500 years before the coming of Christ. And yet it fulfilled exactly to the, to the year his coming and it names him as Messiah. I mean, that's prophetic. And it's not something that... Prophetic of maybe a anointed one, yes, but uh, of this person you call Jesus or Yeshua or Yahweh Shawai or whatever you want to call him. Yeah, no, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, point to this particular guy. It, it points to an anointed one. Well, it was in 29 CE that he was baptized and is, according to the text, is linked as Messiah. Okay, well, this is bloke yeah, down the pub. I mean, pub's. you can't just say it's anybody. Thus, thus says bloke down the pub. All right, well, that doesn't make any kind of sense. I will be right back. Okay. Ooh. Hold on, Anthony.
All right, welcome back everybody for second hour. Uh, just really quick, a comment. As far as the you know, Emmanuel in Isaiah, which means God with us, um, the reason that is associated to Christ is because he fulfilled that. He was God with us when he came into the flesh, incarnated as God incarnate into human flesh form. He was born of a virgin, Bethlehem, tribe of Judah. Uh, he was the heir of David. Um, even the fact that, you know, the, he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, um, that they would cast lots for his, um, for his vestments. All of those things are encoded in the scripture. Uh, the fact that his name, Yahushua, which is what I choose to call him, means Yahweh saves. I mean, it's all connected. And I understand that you don't want to see that, Dave, and you choose not to, um, you know, see those connecting links. But... In my mind, it seems to be absolutely plain, but I'm going to give Kathy a chance to say one thing. She's going to, since Anthony has joined us for the second hour, she's going to say one thing, and then she's going to um, log off so we can have discussion. Go ahead, Kathy. Thank you. I just wanted to say, um, and, and this is partly why I wanted to bring up the uh, Dr. Panin's work in the beginning because of the supernatural nature of the Old and the New Testament. There's a uh, cohesive um, uh, coupling, uh, and it's not really the Old and the New Testament. It's all God's story. And I I had a, a, a an impression that Dave is is taking individual short stories and and looking at the the Old Testament perhaps in that way where um, Zen and what I've really learned through Zen's books is a, a fullness, a completion of the entire history of God's plan for us uh, in this world, which makes complete sense. And so I just would encourage Dave to maybe look at the larger picture. So off now and on to you guys thank you all right we appreciate you sister uh anthony woodcock has joined us for this second hour uh welcome anthony uh, and uh he was not able to listen to the first part of the show so i'm nope. gonna uh i'm gonna give um dave chance to respond and also to speak about just uh, another point whichever whatever you'd like to bring up dave uh, and then we can, you know, continue in roundtable discussion. But oh, well, wait, can you tell me a little bit about what you guys spoke? Yeah. Regarding? OK, well, um, just in the first part of the show, Kathy had mentioned the work of uh, Dr. Ivan Panin and how he was a atheist. But uh, having discovered this mathematical code uh, in uniting both the Old and New Testament and um, it, it it changed him and transformed him into becoming a Christian and accepting the scriptures as being divinely inspired. Are you uh, talking about the Bible codes, or are you just talking about the standard uh, no, numerology this, in the Bible? No, just that there's this um, a, a series underlying of seven. signature. Yeah. Well, it's, it's even greater than that. It's an underlying signature, every single character in the Bible being where it should be. But it, right, it's, right, right. You're talking it's about like, like the spaces between letters and such. No, no. Yeah. It's much you, you're gonna have to, yeah, you're going to have to look up his work. Cause, so uh, there's, there's more than one Bible code. Interesting. Well, yeah, there's, there's numerous uh, ways to look at the Bible codes, but yeah. Yeah, the Bible code is not even something that we have brought up. But yeah, that's another facet of um the you know uniting both the old and the new testament as well and showing divine inspiration behind all of that because i mean how do you get all that encoded um 
into the text unless it is inspired by the mind of God. But that's a whole other thing. And then as far as we were talking about the prophecy in Daniel, which speaks about um, Messiah, his being cut off, and also... Um, the exact day. The, the exact yeah, day. Yeah, the exact day and exact right. year, Something all of that, that. right. Uh, but Dave's not familiar with that uh, either. And then I was also just talking about, you know, there's 300, however many different prophecies um, alluding to Christ being born of a virgin, that he would be of the tribe of Judah, be a Bethlehemite uh, called a Nazarene, uh, that he would be of the line of David, that, um, I mean, just so many things. Even as I said that, you know, they would cast 30 uh, he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. They would cast lots for his vestments. He would be crucified and rise, rise again. Uh, all of those things have, have been confirmed in numerous ways by different, uh, many different texts. And so, um, and so we'll, just to catch you up, but we'll turn it back over to Dave and then we'll go to you afterwards, Anthony. Go ahead, Dave. Okay. <laughs> um, I, again, I'm looking at this as reading a story, okay, and um, and literally uh, you're coming at with coming at me with uh, with um, you know calculations and, uh, and numerology and stuff, yeah. That uh, okay, well, from looking at uh, the flat Earth and uh, you know coming up against people um, who all they have is calculations and and numerology, yeah. Basically, you can make numbers say anything. That's all I can say. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, that's I'm, not true, but you can make numbers say anything. If you got, if you start with a uh, desired result, yeah, you can actually, you know, work out. So you get the numbers to work out nicely. Well, it I, happens I mean, all I'm the a time. mechanical engineer, but I mean, I understand what you're trying to say, but uh, that's called fudging numbers. That's not, you know, being yeah, exactly particular with real numbers. True. But go ahead. I mean, go ahead. I'll yeah. just let you talk. Go ahead. Right. Well. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me so much to, to sort of, uh, so many points to look at. But um, the point is, you were saying that, um, yeah, the, it's pointing to the Messiah. Well, as I said, the Messiah just means anointed. And there have been several people through the Bible that uh, were anointed. And the, the, the one that, that the Most High himself says in the Old Testament who is the anointed one who will be the, the one in the last days um, to, to be the king of, of, of Israel, is David himself. It says it six times in the, uh, in the Old Testament. Um, uh, again, you know, this is thus saith the Most High, not thus saith uh, Joe Bloggs down the pub. Um, you know, if he says it six times then, you know, why are people um, disputing what the Most High himself says? Okay, well, where, what chapter, what verse are you saying? And you're saying that he, it says specifically in these verses that he will be uh, the Messiah for the end of days? This, yes. is, an a this is an atheist argument. I, I, I remember seeing this yeah. argument back when I was like, back in like uh, 1990. Uh, six. I remember atheists bringing this one. Up. I can't. I, it's so it's so old. I haven't heard this one in so long. Uh, yeah, go ahead. What, what yeah, verses let's let's let them let's let them bring out the specific chapter and verses. All right, go ahead, Dave. Okay. Um, well, just choosing the first one at random. It's uh, Hosea three four to five. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, without a prince, and without a sacrifice, without an image or an ephod, or without teraphim. Ephod and teraphim are um, priestly vestments and stuff. Um, afterwards, the children of Israel shall um, return and seek the Lord, uh, seek the Most High, and, and David their king, and shall fear the Most High and his goodness in the latter days. That's now. No, 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 no. See, when it says in, or, in the latter days, it's referring to the latter days of that time frame, not the latter days. Uh, okay. Okay. Bearing in mind that this is way well after um, David was already dead. You're talking about Hosea 3, right? Yeah. 3, 4, and 5. I'm looking at it right now. <coughs> Hosea, 8th century BC. <coughs> Can you uh, bring a, another one while we're looking at this? Okay. Um, uh, while, while you're looking it up, yeah. Um, try. Uh, um, Ezekiel 34, 22 to 24. 
Um, Can you read it, Dave? Okay, therefore I shall save my flock and they shall be no more a prey. Uh, again, this is talking about the, the latter days now because this is happening now. I will judge between cattle and cattle and I'll set, them, set one shepherd about over them. He shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, he shall be their shepherd and I, the, the Most High, will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Most High, have spoken it. Okay. I'm um, looking at an apologetic check. site right oh. now about this. It says, uh, it's, it's talking about this very verse, uh, Hosea's prophecy and the return of the king. Uh, Sorry, can we, can we, can, is there any way that we can actually keep it to the, the Bible that we're talking about here? Rather than we're talking, you, you mentioned Hosea 3. What do you mean? I'm talking about the exact verse you mentioned. But you're talking about somebody's interpretation in some... This is your um, interpretation. You're giving us... No, 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 no. You're, you're reading from something, aren't you? Well, see, Dave, uh, you're, you're reading something, but see, Jesus was of, this, of the seed of David, and David was a, a, a type of Christ. <clears throat> so if um, Jesus was a type of Christ then there could be some sort of symbology going on here that you're, you're maybe misunderstanding. That's what I think as well. Symbology. Well, you know, thus saith the Most High. You know, there's no symbology Matter there. Matter of fact, saying, says, David. You see, what this apologist is saying is that Paul interpreted it that way in some of his writings about this particular verse, that it was referring to Jesus <clears throat> as a type. Right, and then we could bring up, like, numerous passages which speak of Christ being... Uh, you know the the Savior Messiah at the end of days, and he's he's the one that will be returning uh, on the seventh trump, and that will actually fulfill the feast of the Lord as laid out in Leviticus 23, which is something I had mentioned to you uh, previously, because it was only Christ that fulfilled the Levitical feast days as they were laid out, because okay. he was the Passover lamb. Uh, he entombed on the Day of Unleavened Bread and then resurrected as the high priest for the wave offering. Okay, I get and it. Okay. Okay. Here, here's, um, here's what it actually is. This is what they're saying is that uh, King David's throne is is given to Christ. And it says that in Luke 1, 32 to 33, he shall be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And what are you reading from? I'm reading Luke. No, no, no. You, you, you just say they said, and then and what are you reading from? Where are you getting the? I'm, I'm know, reading the, a quote. I'm reading a quote of Luke one thirty-two thirty-three. No, yeah, I know. But before from that, our, before that, you, you you just said they said, and then you started reading the quote. So you're reading from something here. Right. What are you reading from? It's an article. An article. Okay, thus saith. What, would you like me to read from my website instead? Is that what you're saying? Because I have no, a no, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get over here is let's keep this to what, you know, literally what the book says and what, you know, you say, not what everybody else says and, and interpretations that have been given to you. Okay, well, well I mean, just, just uh, really about. quickly, um, we are saying that, you know, we interpret this as being referenced to Yeshua uh, since he was, you know, an archetype like David and of the line of David, and he is the one that will actually return at the end of the day. Be the Savior. Yeah, be the, be savior. the Savior. Well, right, then, because okay. there's reference to him as being such in, again, many different passages, mm -hmm. even from the Book of Enoch. In the New which, Testament. No, no, well, no, but what I was, trying, the book I was of trying to Enoch, say a certain thing, too, actually. I was trying to indicate that... Uh, I was trying to read Luke 1, 32 to 33, and then you interrupted me. I was trying to explain what it... I was just trying to read it to you, but you interrupted okay, me. Okay, okay, go ahead. Sorry. He shall... And this is from my website, I don't, which is a Bible. So, he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, what I wanted to indicate from this is that Jesus is given the throne of David. It's still... Uh, he is of the uh, of the kingly descendant of David, so as a result, it's considered David's throne, and that Jesus is inheriting David's throne, and that's what it's referring to with the Hosea three. Yeah, in in the New Testament. Okay. No, no, no. It, Hosea three, the way they're speaking, they're speaking from David's uh, kingship, and anybody that that falls in the line of the kingship is 
is under David. So Jesus receiving the kingship from David means that that's why that's why it correlates with Hosea 3. It's it's how they thought when they wrote that. It it wasn't written in the 21st century. Hosea 3 or Hosea was written a very long time ago, uh, mm -hmm. eighth century, eighth century BC. So they didn't when they when they say something like King David, it's referring to his entire uh, kingship. It's not referring to just the man David. <clears throat> but that's that's again that's an interpretation because it, but you know see, there's... your interpretation is from a 21st century standpoint. You're not taking well, it. No, I'm not. I'm not century. Take... I'm not taking it from the 21st century. I'm literally looking at what it says. Yeah. Which 21st um, century guys? No, it just says it's. Well, we in, we interpret this differently. We, I understand what you're saying, uh, Dave. And so I want to share something with you because you said that you know there's no allusions to Christ as being the Savior Messiah, but I'm going to read one passage from the Book of Enoch, which it it, it predates four centuries before. <laughs> Christ. And it says, in that place I beheld a fountain of righteousness, which never failed, encircled by many springs of wisdom. Of these all the thirsty drank and were filled with wisdom, having their habitation with the righteous, the elect, and the holy. In that hour was this Son of Man invoked before the Lord of Spirits and his name in the presence of the Ancient of Days. Before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of heaven were formed, his name was invoked in the presence of the Lord of Spirits. A support shall he be for the righteous and the holy to lean upon without falling, and he shall be the light of nations. He shall be the hope of those whose hearts are troubled. All who dwell on earth shall fall down and worship before him, shall bless and glorify him and sing praises to the name of the Lord of Spirits. Therefore, the elect and the concealed one existed in his presence before the world was created and forever. This is also verified in Proverbs chapter 8. In his presence he existed and has revealed to the saints and to the righteous the wisdom of the Lord of Spirits, for he has preserved the lot of the righteous because they have hated and rejected this world of iniquity and have detested all its works and ways in the name of the Lord of Spirits. For in his name shall they be preserved and his will shall be their life in those days shall be the kings of the earth and the mighty men who have gained the world by their achievements become humble in <clears throat> countenance. For in the days of their anxiety and trouble, their souls shall not be saved and they shall be in subjection to those whom I have chosen. I will cast them like hay into the fire and like lead into the water. Thus shall they burn in the presence of the righteous and sink in the presence of the holy. Nor shall a tenth part of them be found. But in the day of their trouble, the world shall obtain tranquility. In his presence shall they fall and not be raised up again, nor shall there be anyone to take them out of his hands and to lift them up, for they have denied the Lord of Spirits and his Messiah. The name of the Lord of Spirits shall be blessed. Uh, again, there's reference to Messiah. And this, mm -hmm. again, is a, a book, the book of Enoch, which predates 300 years uh, what you're referencing as far as the New Testament. So this is not a New Testament text, and it is absolutely prophetic in reference to Christ. I'm, I'm not doubting um, a Messiah, but I'm doubting that it's this Jesus character. What I'm saying here, right, you just um, you talked about him being the Savior. Can you savior. clarify what you mean by that? Uh, what do you mean by this Jesus character? And, and also, no. we just showed you from Daniel. The, no, no, no. You know, I'm just, I'm just asking a question. I'm not trying to, to make a point. I'm asking, because I'm curious what he means by Jesus character. Do you mean the Jesus that's that's represented by certain types of uh, theology or churches, or do you mean just Jesus in general, no matter what? Or, or do you mean there's like some sort of Jesus that's been lost? The character or? purported to be the son of the Creator um, in the New Testament. And he's okay, so you're not talking about like you know the now, fact that he's he's made into sole invictus by the Catholic Church or any of that kind of okay, stuff. Okay, no, I'm, I'm I've answered your question. Yeah, um, I was actually trying to make a point before you asked the question. No, so I just you, I was curious because I'm trying to figure out where you. But I answered the question. You you asked which one, and that's who I'm talking about. He's so, talking right. about all that is referenced with um, Yeshua or Jesus Christ in the no, New I under, Testament. I understand. I was just I was curious because right. I didn't even know his viewpoint. Okay, okay, well, yeah, Didn't that's know. what, that's what, yeah. And right. so anyways, let me make one real quick point. As far as the, the prophecy in Daniel, we were talking about how it references and connects to 
this particular Jesus Christ that you're speaking about, it shows and connects to him as being Messiah. And that also references and connects to what I just read from in the book of Enoch, uh, as far as his being Messiah. <laughs> Well, you read, you read from the book of Enoch, and yet again, it's vague allusions to a Messiah, okay? No, nothing... nothing There's only one can, Messiah. Can you let me finish this time? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Right, so it's vague allusions to a Messiah. The Messiah meaning anointed one, right? Many Messiahs, right? Okay? Now, you mentioned that, you know, this uh, Jesus is the Saviour. Okay, we said that a few times now. Um, you look at the Old Testament, it says time and time and time again, as if the Most High is trying to make sure that nobody can make any mistake here, that there is no, there is no Savior besides me. It says Isaiah, it. Um, Isaiah 45, I think, or 48. Uh, Isaiah 13:4, Isaiah um, 43:3, Isaiah 43:11, Isaiah 44. Right. 44, 6, Isaiah 45, 5, Isaiah right, right, 45, right. 21, Ezekiel. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, there's, there's just loads and loads and loads and loads where he says that actually, I, use no, that argument, I actually use those verses to prove that Jesus is God. I, you're saying that okay. you're because I think that God is one and that if Jesus is a Messiah, it, he, obviously he gives his glory to no other. Those verses you're talking about, it says, I'm the only Savior. I give my glory to no other. Well, the only way he would give glory to another is if it's a separate being. This and this means that if Jesus is a Messiah, he has to be God, according to Isaiah 43. Right. It also, it also says, uh, um, there is no side there is no God beside me. There is right. no so, there is nobody beside me. It's just me. Well, right. I'm saying Jesus is God. I'm saying there's one in the same place. All right. So we've got, we've gone to the the three part God idea. Okay. Well, personalities, which, modes, persons, however you want to look at it. The three part okay. Trinity, which is never mentioned in the Old Testament as well. But also sure, Genesis um, one, one. Genesis Proverbs one. chapter eight and Genesis Proverbs one, chapter one. three. Well let me let me let me search let me just search for Trinity and see where it comes. No no uh, no, no. Genesis one, oh. one. Oh, Genesis one one, what's that? It's well it when it says Elohim. let us Elohim. Yes. Us. yes, I know, and I've looked that up, and basically it means angels. It's angels, no, no, fallen no, no. angels, false gods. No, 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 it can be angels, gods, the god. It can, you're talking about um, the usage of the term. No, what you're missing the here term is can mean, it can mean It can mean angels, it can mean god, it can mean... Uh, it can mean well, what, you're missing, what you're missing about um, uh, Paleo-Hebrew is that you don't... Um, cherry pick the meaning from, I'm not, from the I'm, not, I'm not cherry picking the meaning this is actually yes. the meaning of the word now let me <laughs> let me finish you do not cherry pick the meaning out of the, the list of meanings you consider all of the meanings together so you're That's saying it could it be works. you're saying theoretically it could be angels that created the earth you're saying it could be theoretically no, a it's plural angels planet. it could be like a god of ten that created you're saying basically it could be any of these things using the it term was angels my point my point was is that the term Elohim is plural, and yes. if, it, if it was just referring to God as being singular and plural in Genesis 1-1, that sort of indicates if it's a plural and a singular, that kind of relates to the, the concept of the Trinity. No, it doesn't, actually, because as I said, it says uh, Elohim, um, angels created the pre-humans, basically. <laughs> then, then, later, it actually says that... Um, uh, it uses a different word. The, it says the Lord God, and it, um, and when it actually cre he created Adam. Uh, hold on, uh, hold on, David. We'll be right back. <laughs> we'll be right back, off. All right, welcome back, everybody, uh, for final segment. I uh, just want to bring up one point, and then we'll go back to Dave, and then we'll go to Anthony. 
but it, this is about the pre-existence of Christ, and it's found in the Old Testament, just as it said in the book of Enoch in the passage where, therefore the elect and the concealed one existed in his presence before the world was created and forever. That's the book of Enoch. Also in Proverbs chapter 8, beginning with verse 22, it says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandments, when he appointed the fountains of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with these sons of men. And again, it's uh, this passage, in my opinion, is absolutely about Yeshua, he and the Father being one, that he preexisted with uh, the Father and the Holy Spirit prior to coming into an embodiment in flesh form as Savior Messiah. Um, and so let me go to Dave, and then we'll go back to uh, Anthony. Go ahead, Dave. Well, again, when you, you, you pull out these uh, verses, right, it's, it's a vague allusion, okay, to, to somebody, yes? Um, that, you know, it's nothing definite. It's always a vague illusion that is always open to interpretation. That's all I'm saying. Now, um, I want to ask you a question, and that's, this is for both of you. What is the story of the Old Testament? What, what is it all about? Okay, because um, there is a story there. Um, I, I want somebody to tell me what, what you think it's all about. Well, it's about the enmity, which would be between the two seed lines, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, as the children of promise and the children of perdition. And that's exactly what we see unfolding throughout the entirety of Scripture, and that Israel was his chosen tribe, his chosen people, the Hebrew peoples, and Christ was the fulfillment of David's line. I was only asking about David. the Old Testament. Old Testament, I just said. It's all of... tied together. Even well, in the Old Testament, Christ is found encoded therein, just as I just read from Proverbs chapter 8. Well, uh, you can't separate it. It's the same thing. Well, the we prophecy. can separate it because there are two Testaments, so, we, so we're you separating it. Well, yeah. Let me bring out one more point, then we'll go to you, Anthony. Even the oldest prophecy... Uh, goes back to Genesis chapter 3 where it speaks about I will put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent and then it speaks about Does how th that wait, not wait, mean? hold on hold on it <laughs> and it also that was actually fulfilled when Christ was crucified on the cross because prior when David had slaughtered Goliath he had chopped his head off he had buried it there on Calvary and so when Christ was crucified on the cross the seed of the serpent was actually nipping at his heel as he was crushing his head. And so that was a fulfillment, and it was a connection to Christ being crucified and the fact that he was crushing the head of the serpent. Well, and, how come, how come he, was never, he was not actually crucified? He was hung on a tree. The same, why, why is that? Same thing. He no, it's was, not. He was cruci even if he was hung on a tree, he was still, he was crucified, he was killed, and then he was resurrected. Hang, hanging on a tree is a curse for an Israelite, okay? And the Israelites are still being cursed almost to this day by being hung on trees. It doesn't mean you are nailed to a cross. It means you are hung on a tree. It says Did five die? times, Did he five die? times in the, in, in the Bible, in your, in your New Testament, it says it five times that he was hung on a tree it wasn't he was nailed to a cross yeah? did, did he die and was he crucified no he wasn't crucified he was he was hung on a tree the cross is not did he, did he, he die this? and was he resurrected <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> you know I'm what, sorry, I, I look at it this way here's an easy way to look at it okay 
Uh, the fact is the, the the gospel writers, when they saw the hung on the tree, they didn't see any discrepancy between that and the crucifixion. Of course, then you could argue, well, there was no crucifixion. But the whole point is, is that they didn't see a discrepancy between Jesus' death on a cross and being hung on a tree. And of course, some people argue, well, he wasn't hung, he wasn't uh, crucified on a cross. It was a pole or it was a tree. You know, honestly, he the point is, is he died for our sins, you know, and it was on a wooden thing, a tree, a pole, a cross. You see what I mean? I mean, what, what's the, I don't understand. What no, no, that, that, that's just Funny that's enough, the that. cross, the cross predates um, Christianity and Christ. It's the cross of Tammuz. Yeah. Well, I would hope it's, it predates, predates yeah. because... Uh, I mean, the Romans were using it to kill people mm -hmm. before Jesus, so... <laughs> no, the cross as a symbol um, predates the Christ cross and Christianity. Is literally that, two lines, two lines perpendicular. Oh, no, no, wait, wait. The cross is literally two lines perpendicular. Of course, there's bazillions of symbols all throughout history of two lines that are perpendicular. I mean, it doesn't really mean a lot. It was... Two lines. The, it was the We're not cross talking of, about, like, a pentagram here. We're talking about two lines. It was the cross of Tammuz, which is... The third no, in another in another train god, which was they, you know, which was um, Nimrod, Serenus, and Tammuz, same as they take, a, they take a picture. They take a picture where it mm -hmm. appears to have a cross. It's not even a cross. It's such mm -hmm. a pathetic argument. Yeah, I okay. agree. But let Dave speak, and then I want to answer him because um, actually, uh, there's some new information that just came to light, which actually proves that um, something. But go ahead, Dave. All right, well, and new information from the guy down the pub, yeah? <laughs> um, the, uh, I'm saying that, uh, you know, the, the idea of the three-part God is a pagan idea that, uh, again, pre predates Christianity. Um, Nimrod, Sururimus, and Tammuz, the cross of Tammuz was, the, was his symbol, and it was brought over to Christianity. You had Osiris... I, Isis and and Horus. You had um, literally. There's there's tons of. Uh, okay, now let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Okay, these these gods you're talking about are all from the Tower of Babel. Okay, they started there. And why? Mm -hmm. where, where were they started by? They were started by Nimrod. Now, who gave Nimrod this idea? Could it perhaps be the being that was in the highest heaven who fell, who happened to know God quite personally because he was his one of his main men in in that realm. Well, I, 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 I can't ask, was. Okay, no, no, no. If you I can't were, ask that question. Friends, no, 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 I no, 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 no. If you were good friends with God and you were in the highest heavens and you're protecting his throne, I think you might know if there was three persons in the Trinity. It's not rocket science. Okay. If I knew you personally and then I and I went against you and then decided to make my own story about you. Wouldn't it make sense that it would be very similar to who you are, at least somewhat, because I know who you are. Now, regarding the cross of Tammuz, that's all bullcrap, dude. Uh, let, right. me, okay. let me answer one thing really quick, um, and then we'll give Dave a chance to answer again. But it, it just recently came out, and this is 2006, uh, the Thracian script was decoded, and it has been verified that the Egyptian hieroglyphics and all of the, you know, the mythologies, all of that, are based on the Thracian culture, which predated the Sumerian, the ancient Egyptian, by 1,500 to 2,000 years. And there's a whole set of stories that are now, we're actually working on translating them and bringing forth. They're called the Thracian Chronicles, and they speak about, and they date back to very ancient times, uh, 400 BC for the very first translation of the Book of Atom and Ua. And they speak about, the Trinity in these texts, and they again, these are dated back to 400 BC, and so they also verify that it, the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic language system is based on the Thracian, and the Thracians were not uh, were knowledgeable and knew the, of the coming of Christ, just as it says in one of the books, the Book of Atamanua, it speaks about pro, in pro, uh, pro, prophetically that he would come. Uh, and that he would redeem Adam and his descendants. And in the first chapter of this particular text, the book of Atom and Ua, it verifies and also shows, uh, again, that the Sumerian, the ancient Egyptian, the Greek, and all these other pagan cultures, they did not predate the knowledge of Christianity, which was in fact passed down through 
Adam and Noah and all these other uh, individuals of his line. And so what all that we uh, we believe in the where it's taught in the world that Sumerian is the oldest culture and civilization in the world and that the Bible is based upon their pagan mythologies. But that, in fact, is not true. Uh, I, have they, a, I have a question for uh, Dave here. Uh, how do you spell the word Tammuz? Um, how do I spell it? Well, I mean, do, what's the first letter of the word? T. T. What? Tau. Tau. So, uh, Tammuz mm -hmm. was not impaled on a Tau. This is where they get the whole connection between the cross is the Tau, the literal, literal alphabetic ter, uh, letter. Tau. That's that's no, the, the, the 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 letter uh, Tau ta. is not a cross. The Tau is not a cross, dude. No, but the uh, the letter Ta or Tav in Hebrew is a cross. What? It's a letter. We're talking about. You're saying he was not crucified on a letter. We're, we're literally. They're saying the Tau letter is similar to a cross shape. Therefore, it relates somehow to Jesus dying on a cross. No, you brought that up. You said, what's yeah, the first man from his name? The letter S is in the shape of a snake. Therefore, the devil came from S or something. That, that's what you're no, saying. No, you brought, you made that up. You just brought that in. You I said, what's the first letter of his name? And, it, and so oh, then you made the connection. Um, um, I don't he see it. Crucified. He was never crucified. He it just They took the letter Tau and said it looks like a cross. Therefore, it's related to Jesus. That's like me saying the, the letter S comes from the devil. predated... It predated, it was a symbol that predated Christianity. And, the, um, what, and so was the Christianity S itself was a, is a pagan religion. So, so the letter S came from the devil because he was a snake? I mean, that's basically your no, argument. I, don't, uh, again, I, don't, I, I, just, argument. I just told you about, and you can look this up yourself. You can look it up that the Thracian people and the Thracian cultures predated the ancient Egyptians, the Mithras culture, uh, the Sumerian and so the Bible was not based upon those mythological and pagan teachings. It actually oh, affirms the opposite, that uh, some of the mythologies which have been bastardized and uh, corrupted, that they are in fact based upon the Christian traditions that were passed down through Adam and Noah and book of the Noah. other yeah, sons. Based on the Book of Noah, we have fragments of the Book of Noah. These Sumer texts were based off fragments. Noah's works. And exactly. there's just some perversions of it. And there is, we're talking about the Tower of Babel perversion. The devil's like, oh, this is this is the truth. I'm going to just pervert it and make my own religion. That's literally what we have here. That's what has happened. And so, in, in fact, the opposite is true of what you're saying, Dave. It's not the, – the Christianity is not based upon the ancient Egyptians or the Sumerians, uh, but it, in fact, predated them. Uh, and this has all been oh. verified. <laughs> It's been affirmed. You can go look it up and study it for yourself. Okay. So so you're saying the Greeks came first? No. Uh -uh, the Thracians. And the Romans came first. Came first. No. The Romans. No. What, what I'm telling you, the Thracian culture, the Bulgarian, uh, it's completely different than the Greeks or the Romans. And their stories predate. They've been uh, verified, authenticated as dating back as far as 400 B.C., to a king called Sistostegs that ruled over that area during that time. Right. Well, all I can say here, you know, because you you bring up these things and say, okay, well, this says it's all real, and oh, okay, <laughs> the same same as a same as somebody bringing up Newton as a flat Earth argument, um, a round Earth argument. Oh, yeah, look, look at this book. It's got lots of calculations in. Great, you know. Okay, I accept it. No, look. All I'm saying here. It's about here, faith, you know. It's all I'm saying faith. here. You have to look into things, and then and then you have to take a step of faith. I am saying. Go ahead, here, Dave. Go ahead. Is that I'm going by what the Most High Himself says in the Old Testament. He says things. He says it in a concrete way. There's no illusions illusions about it. There's no. I wouldn't um, say it's concrete because you have English translations mm -hmm. that have a lot of errors in them. Let let him speak. Go ahead, Dave. Well, he's not right. right. He's not right. But well, go ahead. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, and we we all have differences of opinion on this, but let it's let him. It's not differences of opinions. What I'm trying to say is I, the I Old agree Testament. With you. When you look at the Greek Septuagint or the Hebrew Tanakh, there are things that they take these these a lot of these atheists and and is Muslims, and I've actually debunked a lot of these. But they'll take two verses that appear to contradict in the English. You go to the 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 ancient Hebrew or Greek, and they don't contradict. It's not right. subjective. It's just a fact. And again, there's um, 
you can look it up. I'll post a link in the chat room. 314 messianic prophecies just from the Old Testament uh, about Christ. And this is not even including all the extra biblical material, which I sent Dave a, a text earlier today that had dozens and dozens of these, and they were Old Testament or before the uh, time of the apostles and the first century CE. And so, I mean, they all verified that Christ was known about, was prophesied about, and that he had, when he entered into the flesh, he had fulfilled all of these prophecies. And so, I mean, I don't see how, I mean, yes, you want to deny all that, but Zen, this is Zen, verified. Zen. You're totally, hey, man, you're just full of it, man. That's, that's the facts. You're just full of it, Zen. Well, some would <laughs> I'm just, say, I'm yeah. just messing with you. I'm yeah, I, I know, brother. I know. It's all good. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I think we're pissing off Dave a little bit. Dave's getting a little flustered because it's like two on one here, but... Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm just making a statement. You know, anybody can look this up that Christ fulfilled all these many prophecies and you're somehow going to debunk all of them. I mean, even the, the passage in Daniel uh, chapter 9 that points to the exact time that Christ and even calls him Messiah. It connects him being Messiah. I mean, I don't know how you can refute all that. But anyways, go ahead, Dave. Let me give you a chance to make a statement. We got four minutes remaining, so I'll give you two minutes, and then we'll give... Um, I, I, I wondered if you'd noticed if I had logged off or not, yeah? No, I didn't know. I actually I didn't know. Getting annoyed. <laughs> no, um... Oh, I'm, I'm, all I'm saying here is, right, you, you can't, you can't sort of count it with, well, well, the tra it, translation, translation errors. No, I'm saying the, the, the Most High says one thing. There's an interpretation in, in, you know, the New Testament, and it's, you know, just a, you know, a vague illusion, and that somehow trumps what the Most High says. I, I remember the Most High said. doesn't actually speak in the New Testament. Doesn't say a word in the okay. New Testament. There, there was something you said in your previous conversation with Zen that I wanted to hit on that had to do with this exact thing. But when the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament, it's not from the Hebrew Tanakh, it's from the Greek Septuagint. That's why when you see these prophecies quoted <clears throat> in the New Testament and they don't correlate exactly to the wording of the of the, uh, I think you already went off. <laughs> no, no, but, I'm, I'm just saying, I, I thought I had two minutes, but... My point, you were trying to make a point in the last conversation with Zen about how these words were not exactly the same between the prophecies being quoted in the, in the New Testament from the Old Testament to the actual Old Testament verse, and the whole point I was trying to say is that the Septuagint is being quoted in the New Testament while the Hebrew Tanakh is the one being translated in the Old Testament. That's why it looks slightly different. All right, let, let's give Ch uh, Dave yep. a minute here. We've got two minutes remaining. Go ahead, Dave. No, no, well, my two minutes is up. It's uh, Anthony's go. Let's go. No, I'm no good, we're man. giving you a chance to finish up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, the, the, that was the point I was trying to make, yeah? Yeah, you've, you've got a story, um, a cogent story that goes all the way through the Old Testament. You get to the New Testament, the story changes. Okay, it's no longer about the the God's chosen people. Okay, it's now everyone's included now, and don't worry about the uh, the laws that you have to follow, the the statutes and commandments. Don't worry about them because this 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 guy has come along and uh, died for your sins, which is against what it says in Deuteronomy, by the way, that nobody, you know, um, every white man should die for their own sins, and against what Most High basically says about oh, human about sacrifice. That. Yeah, he abhors human man, sacrifice. So. No, I understand where you're coming okay. from. Actually, <laughs> no, I understand where you're coming from, man, because uh, a lot of people have taken the New Testament and have put it in a different slant to where... It's it's you can see things that don't exactly correlate, like for example, exist, uh, for example, the afterlife. But actually, if you start looking into it in the ancient languages, it does correlate. It's just that the English translations make a, a disconnect, I think, uh, and that's where sort of the problem comes in. Well, I anyways, we yeah. only got one minute remaining, and I just want to close up. I want to thank Dave for his willingness to come on. Thank you, Anthony, for coming on, for all of everybody. Uh, I know that we have disagreements. We all interpret, you know, the the, dif the scriptures differently. It's up to each and every one to go out there, do their own homework, and to verify 
uh, whether Dave's um, truth is, uh, you know, linked to yours or mine and Anthony and, and Kathy, you know, and believe as believers in Yeshua as being Savior Messiah and that he did die on the cross and was resurrected or died on a tree, whatever. He was resurrected and he uh, was the fulfillment of the Levitical feast days. He was the Passover lamb. He was the uh, high priest that resurrected uh, first fruits, and that was Adam and his descendants, and that he's coming again. That's the most important part, is he is coming again. We are the fig tree generation, and he will separate the harvest, the wheat and the tares, and that is the full the fullness of the story, in my opinion, of the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent as it played out. Who Dave, are if, the wheat and the tares, by the way? The, the wheat are the children of Adam, the righteous, uh, uh, and the tares are the children of Cain. Right, but who are they in this day, today? Who are uh, they? New World Order against humanity, those that are sitting on the thrones of the world today. Uh, okay. The synagogue of Satan, those who say they are Jews but are not. Mm -hmm. uh, it's okay. all connected. Uh, uh, Dave, give out your website. Yeah, uh, com. Anthony, give out your website. Uh, GodRules.net, and my YouTube is GodRules. I actually have four account accounts, but just GodRules is a good one. <laughs> okay, and I, I know that there's no way we were going to be able to cover this whole topic and issue in in two hours, And um, but I, I hope that at least we had you know some I inspirational conversation that maybe will get y'all to go out and to look into it your, yourselves, but uh, we appreciate all of you. I don't know why um it hasn't kicked us off maybe we're already disconnected from the <laughs> maybe i don't know oh, oh there, there it goes, goes. There all right go. god bless all be blessed okay yeah god bless you guys good night all bye that's yeah